Season 5 marks The Simpsons' first midlife crisis as a series. I know it's crazy, now that they're in season 30-something, that the show could be having a midlife crisis all the way back then. But consider the average lifetime of a TV series and where they were. The show had been going on for four seasons already, very gradually evolving its style each year. But then a lot of the writers leave the show for new creative projects, including previous showrunners Al Jean and Mike Reese. They hired David Merkin as the next showrunner, along with a slew of new writers to fill out the vacancies. So what now? How does The Simpsons continue to evolve and change while still keeping their standards high? How will these new writers keep the show fresh? Well, one way to do it is by expanding the scope of the series. Season 5 shifted to much bigger, more plot-driven episodes. I think big is one of the best words to describe this year of The Simpsons as a whole. I mean, this is when Homer goes to space. The bigness should be pretty self-evident. The series really followed the lead of stuff like Marge vs. the Monorail and Whacking Day, and took on these big macro looks at an event in Springfield. We get big topical satires, like their take on legalized gambling, the self-help industry, vigilantism, NASA, and sexism in the toy industry. Compare Season 4's Lisa the Beauty Queen to Season 5's Lisa vs. Malibu Stacy. The former opens with Lisa struggling with her self-esteem and then morphs into the beauty pageant and big tobacco stuff. Whereas the latter example hits us with those issues up front. Lisa is appalled, then sets out on a plan to fix things. We've done Lisa's self-esteem stories, let's try something new. Now, this isn't to say that these topical stories don't care about their characters. Just look at stuff like Bart's inner child or Springfield. A plot-driven narrative still says something about his characters, after all. We've just started seeing less of these arcs up front in Act 1. They were much more interested in getting straight to the action, looking at the issues in full detail. As a result, Season 5 is much stronger and more direct in regards to its satire and social commentary. They're much more explicit in actually talking about these issues, and not just being subtext in whatever character drama is happening. Marge on the Lamb is a nice portrayal of Marge and Ruth Powers' friendship, yes, but it's framed through the lens of society's expectations of men and women. Sure, Homer the Vigilante has a nice emotional core with Lisa, but is more interested in satirizing neighborhood watch groups and discussing how we underestimate the elderly. Also, it has a treasure hunt. This isn't a particularly surreal season either. We don't get Leonard Nimoy teleporting away, or God showing up to affect the plot. God has no place within this season! This era took the stance that we humans do enough ridiculous and stupid stuff on our own to create these absurd situations. Who needs miracles and magic when you can have an angry mob? Speaking of which, one of the most constant themes of this season is how easily and how willing people are to form angry mobs. What's that you say? There's a dog in the vents? Class is cancelled. Is that a new Malibu Stacy doll? Toy Store Stampede. Mr. Burns just took over all the TV stations? Let's bombard the Simpson household. Groupthink runs rampant in Springfield. The general public will be pointed to a goal and won't question it. The show lays a lot of the blame at the feet of the media during Season 5. Kent Brockman actively stokes some of these fires, bringing in experts to recommend panicking, welcoming our new ant overlords, or teaching us about the Killbot factory. Spoiler warning, we'll get more of this in Season 6. The people of Springfield had always been portrayed as sheep. This era tended to ramp up their more violent and destructive tendencies. These tendencies also manifested at the personal level. Bullying was another pretty constant theme in Season 5, even more than usual for this show. I mean, you have Bart turning into a nerd in one episode, and Homer yelling out the window at them in another. Not to mention, Homer basically bullying his son all the way through the Junior Campers episode. Season 5 is very tribalistic, very aware of the different characters' social and economic classes. Ironically, this is probably the first season where money issues don't constantly drag down the Simpson family. Sure, they can't afford their elephant, but who really could? It's not like they're suddenly going broke from Marge gambling, or that Bart buying an animation cell will bankrupt them. When money does come up in the plot, 
It's usually because they're trying to get at Mr. Burns' fortune. The show had started to pivot away from the more traditional down-to-earth sitcom problems. This was probably a good move to avoid becoming too stale or repetitive. How many times do we really want to see the family go broke because Homer loses his job? Maybe it's time to put that concept on the back burner for a year or two. I had commented in the Season 4 retrospective that the show wasn't really about destroying the sitcom back then. They were mostly about pumping it full of drugs. I'd say Season 5 rebelled against that idea, that it didn't want to go for traditional endings where Tom and Peppy get together, or Marge and Homer ride off into the sunset. They want to play around with the format more, do slightly unconventional plots. Remember how Season 2's Blood Feud ended with the family questioning what the actual moral of the episode was? Well, Season 5 has that in spades. They were really into deconstructing how the sitcom moral doesn't really work for their plot. You'll have Marge bluntly declaring it's an ending at the end of Rosebud, Homer saying everyone's fine at the end of Bart's inner child, or the elephant guy simply explaining some people are just jerks. Sometimes they'll get even more meta and comment on the plot while it's happening. Homer and Apu supposedly wraps up its story early in Act 2, then wraps up a few seconds early again at the very end. Homer Loves Flanders has Lisa and Bart observing how backwards it is that Homer and Flanders are friends, worrying about their status quo ending. We literally get a flash forward to next week. The show is determined not to repeat patterns, not let the audience know exactly where it's going. It can lead to some rather unexpected final act swerves, or in the case of Secrets of a Successful Marriage, a very unintuitive way of getting Homer and Marge back together. The show transitioned from being a less sugary comedy to a slightly saltier one. Which is really odd, considering Simpsons sugar posting comes from this season. Oh well. The point is that the show shifted away from playing these feel-good moments straight. They'd been living in a world where Seinfeld is the biggest and most critically acclaimed comedy around. It's not surprising The Simpsons went away from the hugging and learning. I would say that this is the most emotional moment of season 5, but I wouldn't put it high in the list of all-time tearjerker moments. If you're looking for dramatic stuff, go somewhere else. In terms of their jokes, season 5 took things in a sillier and more subversive direction. The show became slightly less dependent on montages, list jokes, and cutaway to film homages. The show would still do parodies and stuff, but you didn't get as many spotlight sequences, like the Indiana Jones or Flintstones ones. They preferred instead to integrate these homages into the plot, or to make the entire story a loose or direct parody. As a result, the references tended to be punchier. Mr. Burns does his Untouchables thing, and we move on. Rain Man and G.I. Joe show up, and then go away. Less cutaways, less referential fantasies, they're all right here. Well, except for Lee Majors. But who wouldn't fantasize about Lee Majors? There's a real absurd Schwarzweldery bent to a lot of the jokes during this year, where it's inexplicable why any person would act the way they do. If I had to pick one joke to represent the absurdity of Season 5's jokes, I'd go with this one from Homer the Vigilante that Professor Frank built this prototype security system, which immediately crashes and catches fire. And then, for some reason, they built a real size version anyway, which proceeds to do the exact same thing as the model. I know I'm explaining the joke right here, but I wanted to highlight this style of humor because it's all over Season 5. This is a world of things falling apart, everything malfunctioning at the worst possible moment. No one learns from their mistakes. Next, we gotta talk about screw the audience jokes. This is a term used by showrunner David Merkin in the DVD commentaries to describe a joke that sets up a traditional punchline or cliche and then completely subverts it. Now obviously, a lot of humor is about subverting our expectations. The distinction is that this specific kind of joke is characterized by that decoy punchline. To use a couple season six examples, Think of Aronson and Zakowski in And Maggie Makes Three, or that cannon pointing at the guard tower in The PTA Disbands. The show is hyper aware of what kind of jokes they tend to do, and have started running in the opposite direction. Two Tickets to Paradise is no longer sad holding music like it would be in previous years. Homer will now sing along with it happily. Joey Jojo isn't just Homer making somebody up, he's actually there at the bar. 
they're not using donkeys to trek through India, they're actually going to the airport. This is honestly my favorite thing about the humor of David Merkin's seasons, just how subversive it is. Even if we're not talking about these strictly defined screw the audience jokes, they're constantly having us expect the unexpected. Season 5 characters hire private investigators in three different instances, and all of them fail at their persuasiveness in three different ways. Oh, you think we're going to do that old season 4 thing of repeating a key word or phrase? Guess again. The character Leopold was basically invented for this purpose and this purpose alone. Speaking of which, we did have a few characters make their debut in Season 5. These include Uter, Rich Texan, Cletus, Leopold, Luigi, and Baby Gerald. Cletus is obviously the biggest standout here, with the rest of them having pretty niche roles overall. What's funny is that three of them got introduced in the same episode, the Series 100th. We continued seeing more and more celebrities show up in Springfield. This time they were a bit more spread out throughout the episodes. I wouldn't say Season 5 has as much of a Hollywood vibe in general. Bart does get famous, but they stick to mostly Springfield stuff. Mostly. Celebrities showing up was more in the Marge vs. the Monorail spirit, where the big events of the plot would naturally draw them in. In terms of our established secondary characters, Mr. Burns took back the crown from Krusty this year, getting the episodes Rosebud and Burns' heir to show off his stuff, and playing key roles in a couple of others. Honestly, Season 5 did a great job at highlighting its secondary characters. It's low-key one of the best seasons for this dynamic. Ned Flanders, Apu, Principal Skinner, and Grandpa each get their own spotlight episodes. In the case of Apu, putting him right smack in the middle of the Simpson household and for Flanders and Skinner, exploring an unlikely friendship with a member of the family. Principal Skinner is probably the biggest overall winner of Season 5. The previous year didn't do a lot of stories at Springfield Elementary. He got a bit lost in the shuffle. Whereas this one really made a point to hammer home the Skinner and Bart dynamic, especially in the back half of the production run. I would say the other big winner of this year was Grandpa. In addition to his Spotlight episode, they emphasized how underestimated the elderly can be, letting him solve the crime in Homer the Vigilante, and getting a job in Lisa vs. Malibu Stacy. I like that Season 5 made sure not to forget its elderly characters. It noticed that Jasper is a very funny individual, and featured him in a lot of one-off jokes. Chief Wiggum is the king of the one-off joke during this era, though. He wasn't the most plot-relevant character or anything, Marge on the Lamb was easily his biggest role, but he was practically omnipresent, popping up in almost every single episode. We are right smack in the middle of the golden era of Wiggum. The same could be said about Barney. He followed up a very strong showing with another just as good. Although I'm pretty sure that Barney killed at least one or two different people this year. I don't think I want to know the story behind this giant syrup bottle. Of the main Simpson family members, the changes to Homer's characterization are probably the most significant. As per usual, they ramped up both his stupidity and his appetite, often combining the two characteristics. The big shift in Homer's characterization was in how aggressively he's portrayed. This is a much meaner, more inconsiderate version of Homer than in previous seasons. They really went out of their way to highlight how Homer can be kind of a jerk to people and animals alike. There's a violent streak to him, he is totally ready to push Mr. Burns down or give him a heart attack. There is a sentiment in the fan community that Merkin era Homer is very much in line with Scully era Homer from seasons 9 through 12, that the dreaded jerk ass Homer is prevalent right here. I would hesitate to say that he's constantly jerk ass here, at least to a point where it's a problem. A lot of his negativity happens because of his ignorance that he thinks he should be copying the formulas of movies and comedy routines. He bullies Bart, but it's too childish to really be mean. Yeah, this is certainly a more aggressive version of Homer, but unlike in the Scully years, Homer usually gets his just desserts. The other characters manage to keep him on a leash. And it's not like he's a total destructive tornado all year, Homer still does have his legitimately kind moments. Now Marge is easily the most thoughtful and emotive character in Season 5. She is just a ball of emotions, that Marge. In most episodes, she just plays a supportive role, 
giving advice to Bard, or suggesting Mr. Burns might be lonely. However, they also portrayed Marge as someone who defies expectations and who will stand up for herself. And not even in the season 3 or 4 way that's centered around having a nervous breakdown. Marge wants to get out there, be friends with Ruth Powers, support the casino initiative, develop a gambling addiction. If Homer is being a total ass to her, she'll kick him out of the house. She ain't putting up with that crap. I do feel like season 5 sometimes forgets Marge exists, but when they do remember, they tend to use her well. Bart's role was basically to be toyed with in almost every single episode. Season 5 was all about screwing with expectations, and most of that was directed toward Bart. His stories revolve around him alternating between being excited and depressed about a given situation. He loves the town wanting to be like him, now he hates it. Yay field trip, boo box factory. Skipping school is awesome, great, now he's a witness. What's really weird is that aside from Cape Fear, Bart is kind of a non-entity during the first half of season 5. He doesn't really show up for Bart's inner child until halfway through. But then the second half of the season makes up for it and hammers home Bart episode after Bart episode. It's almost like Bart complained to his agent and the producers gave in to his demands. Homer is still certainly the main character, but Bart refused to be ignored. Lisa became the most meta character on the show. Unlike Marge, who would support the characters from a personal angle, Lisa was more apt to comment on the plot itself, either in how weird it is or laying out the philosophical argument to her family and the audience. She is written as being more socially conscious during season 5, more willing to call people out and look at the big issues. Lisa will question who polices the police, observe that Homer is being cruel to Stampy, object to Mr. Burns's sexist application process, call out the entire Malibu Stacy Corporation. As the stories got bigger and bigger in scope, Lisa's usage reflected that change. Yeah, she's certainly used as the emotional core in a couple of stories, the writers definitely remembered how good she is at that. However, this wasn't really a year of personal discovery for Lisa. There's a small part of me that misses the more traditional character arcs and heartwarming relationship stuff when I'm watching season 5. But in doing research for this video, I gained a new appreciation for the direction they took it. I like that the show was self-aware enough to acknowledge their old tricks, that they looked for new ways to push the envelope, looked for new ways to surprise the audience. I like that they went for these big event episodes and these overarching parodies. I have praised how down-to-earth the earlier seasons are, how observational and charming they can be. I wouldn't say season 5 is a charming season. But sticking to that kind of style would put the Simpsons in a rut. This sort of midlife crisis is inevitable for any TV show, where the producers look around and say, what now? Hiring a new showrunner like David Merkin sparked a lot of new energy for the show, brought a sensibility that we hadn't quite seen before. There are aspects of the Merkin years that I don't personally like as much, but variety is the spice of life, and I'm glad they tried more and more things. I love that the Season 5 brand of humor complements the other ones so well. Let me know in the comments what you think of Season 5, and how you think the series changed. I recommend watching a few episodes from Seasons 4 and 5 back to back to get a feel for these different sensibilities. I used to think of 5 as being only an exaggerated version of 4, but it really is its own distinct flavor. Season 5 has surprised me once again. As of this moment, I have absolutely no idea how to rank the majority of these episodes, so I'll be back after I binged a bunch of all syrup squishies until I can get 10 episodes that make sense. As always, thanks for watching.